This is Pastor R. Norheim presenting the Gospel in Sermon and Song sponsored by the Lutheran Gospel Out Association, Pasadena, California, released on a special network of selected radio stations in the United States, Canada, and overseas, maintained by the prayerful, free will, tax-deductible gifts of listeners. We frequently hear that missionaries in foreign lands are asked by natives why Christian people are so happy. Their religions seem to be lacking joy. Well, J stands for Jesus, Y for you, and when Jesus takes your sins away, then you have J-O-Y, joy, because there's nothing between you and Jesus. your sins away, and you have J-O-Y, joy, because there's nothing between you and Jesus.
and praise thee, Lord Jesus, for putting that song of gladness in our heart. And therefore our faces shine forth the gladness of the Lord, so that strangers to grace may ask, what makes you so happy? And then we know we can reply, it is Jesus that makes us glad, for thou hast put gladness in our heart. And we pray that those are still in the shadow of death may find life, a life abundant, a cup that's filled to overflowing. Grant that also this broadcast today may be in thy hand to be used to that purpose. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. If That Isn't Love is the song sung by the Seattle Rock of Ages praise singers. Another testimony.
Little is Much When God is In It is the title of our selected song of the month written by Mrs. F. W. Suffield. Mrs. Norheim and I are singing it for you this month, and you may have a free copy of Words and Music on request. It's not found in many songbooks, so we are fortunate, I'd say, to find it and to use it as our song of the month. Ask for Little is Much and address your letter to Lutheran Gospel Hour, Post Office Box 12, Pasadena, California. In Canada, write to Lutheran Gospel Hour, Post Office Box 201, Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. <laughs> Little is much when God is in it. I can imagine the little boy saying that to his mother when he returned home after Jesus had blessed the lunch that she had given him of five barley loaves and two fishes that fed 5,000 men besides women and children. And that's only one of countless instances where God has miraculously touched little things and multiplied them. What is that in thy hand? God asked Moses. Only a rod, he answered. But with God using it, miracles were performed before King Pharaoh in Egypt, and waters parted to make a way through the Red Sea for Israel. What you have in your hand, be it great or small, when you give it to God, he will bless and multiply to transform millions delivered by God's word. So don't think that what you have is too little to send to the Lutheran Gospel Hour. Prove me now, saith the Lord, and I will open the windows of heaven and pour out blessings so there will not be room enough to receive it. Amen, we say, and we shall rejoice with you. Our mailing address, remember, is Lutheran Gospel Hour, Post Office Box 12, Pasadena, California. And in Canada, Lutheran Gospel Hour, Post Office Box 201, Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. I repeat that address, Lutheran Gospel Hour, Box 12, Pasadena, California. And in Canada, Lutheran Gospel Hour, Box 201, Saskatoon, Saskatchewan.
Apostle Paul, writing in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 2, stated, For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. About 1,600 years after this statement was made, 2,000 clergymen in England were expelled by the so-called Act of Uniformity, August the 24th, 1662. Among these was one clergyman named John Flavel. He continued to mingle with his people amid persecutions, obstacles, and interruptions, preaching as opportunity permitted in private dwellings, obscure neighborhoods, or on the, or the seclusion of the forest. And through a period of 25 years, until 1687, when the royal license was granted to worship God without molestation, and he resumed his public labors in a new and commodious church, erected by his affectionate people, delivering at that time his series of sermons on Revelation 3.20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Most of his works comprising six octavo volumes which breathe a strain of tender piety and have a spiritual unction perhaps unparalleled were written during this period of persecution. A Baker Book Company of Grand Rapids, Michigan, has reprinted in book form of 556 pages of these sermons, published first in 1671, rather, and called The Fountain of Life. The contents are so deeply spiritual and at times so profound that we might imagine he wrote from a secluded study somewhere where no one uh, would enter to interrupt him. But quite the contrary, he says, these studies were written in a time of great distractions and delivered to such audiences as could be assembled. He gives thanks to God who so signally protected and overshadowed the assembly in those days of trouble wherein these truths were delivered when he sat under his shadow with great delight and his banner over them, he says, was love who did not leave himself without witness, blessing his labors to the conversion and edification of many. I quote today to my radio listeners part of the chapter one of The Fountain of Life by John Flavel and want to share this with you in a few moments uh, in part of my sermon today. And it's set forth so clearly here in this uh, book that I, uh, I, I wish I could give more, but here we start with the text. For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified, 1 Corinthians 2.2. 2. The former verse contains an apology for the plain and familiar manner of the apostles' preaching, which was not with excellency of speech or of wisdom. He studied not to gratify their curiosity with rhetorical strains or philosophical niceties, for he says, I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. This uh, meaning, uh, this, uh, the meaning is not that uh, he despised or countenanced all other knowledge, but so far only as it might stand in competition with or opposition to the knowledge of Jesus Christ. As if he had said, it is my stated, settled judgment, not a hasty, inconsiderate censor, but the result of my most serious inquiries. After I have well weighed the case, viewed it exactly on every side, balanced all advantages and disadvantages, pondered all things that are fit to come into consideration about it. This is the issue and final determination that all other knowledge, how profitable, how pleasant soever, is not worthy to be named in comparison with the knowledge of Jesus Christ. This, therefore, I resolve to make the scope and end of my ministry, and the end regulates the means. Such pedantic toys and airy notions as injudicious ears affect and would rather obstruct than promote my grand and design among you. Therefore, wholly waving that way, I applied myself to a plain, popular, unaffected dialect, fitted rather to pierce the heart and convince the conscience than to please the fancy. I determined not to know anything, to study nothing myself, to teach nothing to you, but Jesus Christ shall be the center to which all the lines of my ministry shall be drawn. I have spoken and written of many other subjects in my sermons and epistles but it is, it is all as consequent upon preaching and making known Jesus Christ. Of all the subjects in the world, this is the sweetest. If there be anything on this side of heaven worthy our time and studies, this is it. 
Thus Paul magnifies his doctrine from the excellency of its subject, accounting all other doctrines but airy things compared with this, Jesus Christ and him crucified. This topic he singled out from all the rest of the excellent truths of Christ on which to spend the main strength of his ministry, Christ as crucified, and the rather because hereby he would uh, obviate the vulgar prejudice raised against him upon the account of his cross, for Christ was crucified to the Jews a stumbling block, to the Greeks foolishness. This also best suited his end to draw them on to Christ, as Christ above all other subjects, so Christ crucified above all things in Christ. The manner in which Paul discoursed on this transcendent subject to them is also remarkable. He not only preached Christ crucified, but he preached him assiduously and plainly. He preached Christ frequently, and whenever he preached of Christ crucified, he preached him in a crucified style. This is the sum of the words to let them know that his spirit was intent upon this subject as if he neither knew nor cared to speak of any other. All his sermons were so full of Christ that his hearers might have thought he was acquainted with no other doctrine. Hence, no doctrine is more excellent or necessary to be preached and studied than Jesus Christ and him crucified. All other knowledge, how much soever it be magnified in the world, is and ought to be a but dross in comparison with the excellency of the knowledge of Jesus Christ in whom are hid all the treasures of God and of wisdom and knowledge. Eudocius was so affected with the glory of the sun that he thought he was born only to behold it. Much more should a Christian judge himself born only to behold and delight in the glory of the Lord Jesus. Consider the excellency of the knowledge of Christ in itself. It is the very marrow and kernel of all scripture, the scope and center of all divine revelations. The ceremonial law is full of Christ, and all the gospel is full of Christ. The blessed lines of both testaments meet in him, and how they both harmonize and sweetly concentrate in Jesus Christ. It is the chief scope of the excellent epistle to the Hebrews to unfold. For we may call that epistle the sweet harmony of both testaments. This argues the unspeakable excellency of this doctrine, the knowledge whereof must needs therefore be the key to unlock the greatest part of the sacred scriptures. For it is in the understanding of scripture much as in the knowledge of logic and philosophy. If a scholar once comes to understand the foundation principle upon which, as upon its hinge, the controversy turns, the true knowledge of that principle shall carry him through the whole controversy and furnish him with a solution to every argument argument. Even so, the right knowledge of Jesus Christ like a clue leads you through the whole labyrinth of the scriptures. The knowledge of Jesus Christ is a fundamental knowledge, and the foundations are most useful, though least seen. It is fundamental to all graces. They all begin in knowledge. The new man is renewed in knowledge. This knowledge is fundamental, we say, to the eternal happiness of souls, as we can perform no duty, enjoy no comfort, so neither can we be saved without it. This is life eternal, that they may know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. And if it be life eternal to know Christ, then it is eternal damnation to be ignorant of Christ. As Christ is the door that opens heaven, so knowledge is the key that opens Christ. The excellent gifts and renowned parts of the moral heathen, though they purchase to, to them great esteem and honor among men, yet left them in a state of perdition because of this great defect, they were ignorant of Christ. The knowledge of Christ is profound and large. All other sciences are but shadows. This is a boundless, bottomless ocean. No creature hath a line long enough to fathom the depth of it. There is height length, depth, and breadth ascribed to it. Yea, it passeth knowledge. There is a manifold wisdom of God in Christ. It is indeed simple, pure, and unmixed with anything but itself. 
yet it is manifold in degrees, kinds, and administrations. Though something of Christ be unfolded in one age and something in another, yet eternity itself cannot fully unfold him. I see something, said Martin Luther, which blessed Augustine saw not, and those that come after me will see which I see not. It is in the studying of Christ, as in the planting of a new discovered country. At first men sit down by the seaside, upon the skirts and borders of the land, and there they dwell, but by degrees they search further and further into the heart of the country. Ah, the best of us, as yet, but upon the, they come to the borders of this vast continent. Our knowledge, though you should attain the highest degree of it, um, would never bring you to heaven. The principal thing, namely Christ, being wanted. Other knowledge is so defective in the purity of its nature, the learned heathens grew vain in their imaginations and in their efforts.